Okay, let's uh, let's jump in, and um, I'll navigate around the screen. Uh, I'll let, might make try to make it a bit bigger as we go through. So we, where we left off last week was we read through the story in Parak Gimel in uh, Daniel, which is the story of Nebuchadnezzar and his great big golden statue, calling all the people together to bow down to this statue made out of pure gold. Uh, the simple shot of the story is a direct re response to the dream that he has and the vision of the large statue that's made up of multiple parts, namely um, you know, gold and bronze and, and uh, copper and, and uh, silver and, and iron, etc. Um, and of course, he wants to, his desire is to respond to that dream by making the equivalent statue, 60 amat high, and making that statue out of pure gold. And that's in his way of saying, okay, bring all the nations of the world together and or within his kingdom and acknowledge his authority and power by bringing the statue and having them all bow down and acknowledge his greatness and his de and his gods, etc. cetera. Uh, and in so doing, uh, kind of counter the challenges that the original dream would create. That by in itself is a relatively straightforward part of the story. And then of course, Hanani Mishal of Azaria, who uh, refused to bow down and thereby throw a monkey wrench into his great plan if the Jews won't bow down to him uh, and acknowledge his or to his statue or to his uh, uh, gold uh, image, whatever it is that he's built. If the Jews won't bow down, then essentially uh, what has he accomplished? Because the whole point of the dream was that eventually the nation that will reassert itself on the stage of history are the Jews in the context of that, that, that last kingdom. Uh, that more or less is the story, and he throws them into the fiery furnace, and they, there's a great miracle, and, and the Malach saves them, and then Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar is moved to uh, respond to that by um, publicly acknowledging the God of, of Israel. Uh, more or less, that's where the story um, itself, just from the text perspective of chapter, of chapter 3. What we then did with that was we said, wait a second, fiery furnace, kivshan eish, throw Jew thrown into the furnace for refusing to bow down. That sounds very much like the Medrash about Avraham. And in fact, what we had suggested was that uh, Chazal often did this, where they would take stories from Tanakh and build a connection to other stories by almost recreating the biblical story in the context of this other event or personality or story or, or context. And so we looked at various examples of that. And it comes back to the question of what connections were Chazal trying to highlight in the parallel between the story of Abraham and his experience with the region of Mesopotamia where he was grow, where he was uh, functioning uh, to the story of Hanani Mishal of Azariah in Bavel under Nebuchadnezzar. And that's where more or less we left off. And what Chazal did was they said, okay, wait a second. You have, you have this giant statue made of gold and you have Nebuchadnezzar and his arrogance on the one hand, and you have Hanani Meshav of Azariah and their faith on the other. And you have Avraham and his faith against the symbol of the arrogance of and power of that era, which is in the language of Chazal, Nimrod. And what I want to do today is kind of work through that link between Nebuchadnezzar and Nimrod to try to better understand what Chazal are trying to reflect in the story. And ultimately where that's going to take us is to the two great structures that symbolize the arrogance and power of the two great leaders of the day, Nebuchadnezzar on the one hand and his statue of gold, and Nimrod on the other, who is the leader of the area of Bavel in the days of Abraham, and Nimrod's story, which we will see exactly what that refers to, but already I think I, I, I kind of led us into the punchline of that in the end of this year last week, where there is a link between Nimrod 
and the Tower of Babel. And so ultimately where our story today takes us is to the parallel between the Tower of Babel and its symbolism and the statue of Nebuchadnezzar and its symbolism. How that relates to Abraham, that's also part of our story for today. So that's kind of the map of where we're going and hopefully we'll get through all of it. Uh, and we're gonna jump right into this Gemara in Chagiga. Well, I think I shared with you at the end of uh, the Shi last week, where Abraham is in the furnace, or is going being thrown into the furnace, and there's a conversation between God in the Medrash, between God and the Malach Gavriel. And Malach Gavriel says he wants to save Abraham, and God says to him, no, he, God is going to save Abraham, but the Malach Gavriel is destined to save the descendants of, or, or another, uh, you know, descendants of Abraham, uh, and that's, of course, a reference to the story of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Gavriel is also a link to our story because Gavriel as a malach is only mentioned once uh, or twice, but in, in the same book, one other book in Tanakh and by name, and that is, of course, in Sefer Daniel. Daniel has many conversations with the angel Gavriel at the end of the book. So you have this direct link, again, in the Medrash between these two stories, and Chazal trying to weave their way through multiple points of connection between these two great moments in history. And one of them is in this Gemara in Chagiga. And that's our starting point. Uh, Gemara says, says the following. Oh, if you can't see it, I'm going to make it a little bit bigger for you. Uh, hopefully that'll work. Tanya Amr of Yochanan, Benzak Amr of Yochanan, Zakai. What response do, did the divine voice provide? Bat kol to that wicked one, and in this case referring to Nebuchadnezzar, bishash amar when Nebuchadnezzar said, "Ele al bamate av edamel elyon," I will ascend above the clouds. I will be like the Most High. What was God's response? to the arrogance of Nebuchadnezzar when in his proclamation that he will rise above the clouds and be equal to the one on high. And in the back of our minds, we should be asking ourselves, where did Chazal see this verse referring to a statement of Nebuchadnezzar? That's the question we're going to come to. But the answer the Gemara gives is yet tabat ko lo. What is what was the response? The heavenly voice came out and said to Nebuchadnezzar, Russia ben Russia, ben bino shall nimrod harasha, wicked son of wicked, grandson of nimrod the wicked. Shehimrid kol haolam kulo la b'machuto nimrod who caused all of the world to rebel against him in the days of his reign. So in this passage are two things that we need to be, that will start our journey. Number one, this verse, as it refers to Nebuchadnezzar, the connection between Nebuchadnezzar and Nimrod, Chazal are connecting explicitly in saying that Nimrod, and that, that Nebuchadnezzar in some way is kind of a great descendant of Nimrod. We'll see that's not a, that's not a biological descendant, but a conceptual right, model. And the response of to, to Nimrod is that he is that to Nebuchadnezzar is that he is essentially following the path set before him in the wickedness of and the arrogance of Nimrod. Tosfot there on that Gemara makes this observation, and he says, We're not talking about a biological descendant of Nimrod. Nimrod comes from the nation of Kush. And uh, we'll see where that's from. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar is certainly not from that region. But, Nebuchadnezzar is associated with Nimrod because Eretz Shin'ar, which is where Nimrod was the king, and, and I'll show you that verse in a second, Eretz Shin'ar is in fact Bavel. And so the region in which you have this great power in Sefer Breshit, Nimrod, and in Sefer Daniel, uh, and in Tanakh as a whole, and Nebuchadnezzar, is in fact the same region, the same area of Bavel. Uh, the Marshal in the Chidushe Agadot says something similar. 
Um, he just makes it a little bit more explicit in terms of the context. Nimrod harasha shemido alam kulo, kemod dechdiv beperiketz in ma'avrin. This is a, a Gemara. Am Rafael Shmo v'nikrash Shmo Nimrod. His name says Chazal was Am Rafael, which is another personality in Breshit. Why is he called Nimrod? Because he caused all of the world to rebel. When did he cause all the world to rebel? Watch carefully. Hainu bidor hapalaga. In reference to the generation of the dispersion, which is the uh, Chazal's way of describing the Tower of Babel. So the tower, the Migdal Babel that they built, Chazal saw as the architecture and the plan of Nimrod. Now, Nimrod is not explicitly mentioned in the story of Migdal Babel, but the link between Nimrod and the tower is very important for us. We'll see it as it plays out. As Rashi explains in Chumash, Nebuchadnezzar is not literally his son, as Tosav explains, but rather Al Shem Shezen Nebuchadnezzar, Ama Eleh Bamotei Av, Nebuchadnezzar's proclamation that I will rise to the clouds and be greater than the one on high, that arrogance against God, that is exactly what is attributed to the story of the Tower of Babel, Nimrod Shehimid B'Malchuto at Dora Palaka, Amar Gam Kein La'alot L'Shamayim. Nimrod also wanted to go up into the heavens. Now, of course, the reference to going up into the heavens is a reference both to the Tower of Babel and Nebuchadnezzar's great statue, of gold that reaches up to the heavens from the perspective of the great height of 60 amot. That was the part of the description of the building of the tower with its head in the, in the sky. We'll see that Gemara in a moment. So where is this verse? So I understand Nimrod, king of Shinar, king of Bavel, Power of Bava was certainly a proclamation of arrogance. That I understand. But this verse, this verse is in Yeshayahu. How does the verse in Yeshayahu link us to Nebuchadnezzar? So that's the story in Yeshayahu Perak Yedalet. I gave you the text here in Yeshayahu Perak Yedalet. Sometimes easier to see it in, a, uh, in the full context of, of uh, well, the source page, but the actual website. So I'm going to take us back to this website, which I've used often which is Yeshayahu, Perik Yedalet, and uh, let's take a look at it in the context of the psukim here. So the, the context of this nevuah begins with the nevuah about uh, Israel returning home, um, a redemptive uh, moment for Israel. And in that context, Pasuk Dalet begins, V'nesata HaMashal HaZeh HaMelech Bavel begin this parable or this statement against the king of Babel. And the king of Babel, of course, is Nebuchadnezzar. So Yeshayahu, in the very early stages, is kind of foreseeing the role that Bava will play, or Babel is already rising up as a power um, parallel to Assyria. Yeshayahu is seeing that rise, but also seeing the arrogance. This is well before Nebuchadnezzar has become the king of an empire. This is well before the Battle of Karkamish. And Yeshayahu sees Nebuchadnezzar and sees the rise of the power of Bavel, and he sees the arrogance that will be the trademark of Nebuchadnezzar. How is the oppressor ceased? The golden city ended, ceased. Madheva is this word which is somewhat debated, whether it comes from the word Dahav or Zahav, Rashi explains, or it, it means uh, more uh, in the context of some sort of oppression. But in the context, but if I translate it from the word gold, the notion of to describe Bavel as the golden city, you already are hearing a foreshadowing of the gold that is symbolizing Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. So that's in terms of the statue and the dream that Nebuchadnezzar eventually has. Shavar Hashem Matera Sheim Shevet Moshlim, God has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers, smote peoples in wrath with an incessant stroke. It's sort of God's, at a time when God, of redemption, God's anger will break the arrogant of, arrogance of the nations of the world. That's the beginning of this, of this uh, story. 
I'm going to jump for a moment to um, Pasukit Aleph. Hurad Sheol Geonecha. Your arrogance will be brought down into the grave. Hemyat Nivalecha Tachtecha. The noise of your nevalim, right, of your of carcass underneath you, you will be uh, covered in worms, right? describing him in the grave. Now, it's, it's always a classic genre of the Nevi'im to say to a human being, if you want to claim that you are a god, that you are a deity, that you are more powerful than God, to describe him as mortal, because ultimately nothing speaks to the to the uh, the contrast between God and man more than mortality. How have you fallen from heaven? Been cast down into the ground. Cast lots over the nations. You in your heart said, Hashemayim e'ele. I will ascend to the heavens above the stars. I will exalt my throne and I will sit upon the throne and the and place of meeting in the northern throne, meaning from my throne in the north, I will sit in the throne that will reach even above the heavens. I will ascend over the clouds. I will be like the Most High, says Yeshayahu to the king of Babel. No, you shall be brought down into the grave to the depths of the pit. In other words, the response to the arrogance of the king of Babel in this context of this Nevoah who claims that he will rise above the throne of the heavens is to say to him, to remind him that all human beings are mortal and no one can say uh, that ultimately that, that mortality uh, is the, uh, the douse of reality upon that, against that arrogance. So that's the context of this Nevoah. And so clearly what Chazal are hearing in this arrogance is exactly what we typically res- interpret as the story of the Tower of Bavel. Right? We all know the classic interpretation of the Tower of Bavel is they wanted to build this tower to throw God out of the heavens. That's how we cl- typically explain it. And we're going to see that that's a little bit more complex than just that explanation, but that's how Rashi certainly understood it. That's how at least one of the opinions in the Gemara understood it. And here, Chazal is saying, well, that's exactly what you... Yeshayahu claimed was attributed to the king of Bavel. So here's the link. Here's the king of Bavel saying, literally, I will build my throne in the heavens and I will throw God. I will sit on the throne of the Most High. And God says to him, try doing that from the grave. And that's exactly the response that we have in the story of the Tower of Bavel. So it's a fascinating link between these two moments. It's almost like I hear it in Nebuchadnezzar, I see it in Yeshayahu's Nebuah. How do we get to this meaning of the Tower of Bavel? That's a story we'll need to explore. Um, and in fact, the story begins with a, just a little background. Who is Nimrod? And if we're talking about Nebuchadnezzar and the arrogance, I understand. Where is Nimrod in this tower in all of this? So we need to go back to Sefer Breshit. We need to start with the story of Nimrod. Who is Nimrod? So, just basic Sefer Breshit. Kush Yoladat Nimrod, Hu Hechel Liot Gibor Ba'aretz. In early generations, Nimrod, born from Kush, begins to be a warrior in the land. That role that Nimrod is as a Gibor, as Gibor Ba'aretz, is a warrior, hold in your thoughts, we're going to come to in a few moments. He was, here we typically translate Sayyid as a hunter, but not in the context of a hunter of animals. That's too simple. Gibor Sayyid is a warrior, a hunter warrior. A warrior needs a kingdom, needs a place to expand his, his war conquests. 
‫זאת אומרת, היא ראשית ממלכתו בבל, ‫בערך ועקד וקלני בארץ שנאה. ‫אז הטקסט אומר לי מאוד קלילי, ‫שאת נמרוד's world, ‫נמרוד הוא ראשית ממלכתו, ‫נמרוד הוא קינג, ‫נמרוד הוא קינג, קינג, ‫נמרוד קונקרס, ‫ואת הראשון פלאס של הקונקרס ‫היא הארץ של שנאה ‫ואת הקינגדום של... Bavel. And of course, Bavel is immediately a reference to the tower because the whole region is called Bavel because of the story of the tower. So suddenly we're linking geography and themes, arrogance, right? Warrior, Nebuchadnezzar, conquest, Nimrod, conquest, warrior, arrogance, Bavel, tower, and great statues. All the themes that come back together. And so this is where we need to kind of sort out exactly what's going on. Uh, Rashi um, uses this as an opportunity again to reflect back from that Gemara in Chagiga that Liot Gibor, the sense of being a warrior, is l'hamrid kol ha'olam ala kodesh baruch hu ba'atzat dor ha'palaga. That warring sense of conquest is to cause the world to rebel against God in the tower in the generation of the dispersion referring to the tower and again all of these themes come back together so where i really want to take us is into the story of the tower of bubble what really was this tower what does it represent what does it mean what happened we often read the story and we kind of don't sufficiently recognize the significance of this little episode at the end of parashat noach and the ramifications it has, not only in terms of Bavo, but in terms of all of biblical history. So after all the background is set, we're going to take a step back. We have the, all the pieces are there. Nimrod, Nebuchadnezzar, Shin'ar, Eretz Bavel, statue, great big gold statue, Tower of Bavo. Yeshayahu's prophecy reflecting Nimrod's, sorry, ne, ne, reflecting Nebuchadnezzar's great arrogance. Nimrod, at least as we attribute it to Nimrod, the sense of arrogance and warrior uh, against God, Gibbot Said Lifnei All those pieces of that puzzle, and of course it ends with the fiery furnace into which Avraham is thrown, according to the Medrash, in Hanani Mishael Vazaria in the story. So we'll have to come back to that. We're going to jump to Breshi Perikid Allah. And I give you, I've given you the text here, Bahi Kola Aretz Safa Achat Utvarim Achadi. Actually, let's do this in in um, Let's do it here in, in the Sefer Breshit. Bahi Kola Aretz Safa Achat Utvarim Achadi. Now, what that means is somewhat open to interpretation, but the entire world was of one language, tongue. Um, we discussed this just a few content in, in, uh, a week or two ago. What is the significance of a language in Tanakh? What do we have by Nebuchadnezzar? That he brought together every Am, Uma, and Lashon. Nation and language. Language is a nationality. Language represents nationality. So by saying that Kola Aretz Safa Achat, that all the people were of one language, what are we really saying? That they were all identified as part of one nationality. Now, if you go into Sefer Breshit, the irony here is that Sefer Breshit, the whole, the whole previous parak, is a description of Eilat told Noach and the description of all the different nations of the world that were born from the children of Noach. In each person born from uh, these nations, if you go back to Bnei Noach, Shem Cham and Yafet, and then Yafet, Gomer, Magog, Mada, Yavan, Tuvar, Meshech, Tiras, Ashkenaz, Rifat, etc., Yavan, Tarshish, Kitim, Dodanim, this is generations before the tower. This is generations, this is a generation or two after the flood. And these are the nations from which the land's languages was developed. And then you have Kush and Mitzrayim. And so 
it's great irony to say that the entire world spoke one, one language when just one chapter ago, we describe at length every descendant of Noah and how they spread out over the world and how they created different nations. So that's one of the mysteries in the story of, uh, of the tower. How is it that we describe kol ha'aretz of one language, one tongue, udvarim achadim, one dibur, one speech, as if they're all one nation. We just finished saying that they're not. Just a chapter ago described the great dispersion of all the different languages and cultures. And Rashi on this uh, verse suggests that that one language was in fact Mashan HaKodesh, was in fact Hebrew, and yet they're speaking all kinds of different languages. So hold that thought, that's a question we have to resolve. They traveled eastward. They found a valley, land of Shinar, they dwelt there. Let's bake bricks and turn them into uh, in a furnace. They'll turn the brick into stone and then they can use mortar and they can begin to build. And once they have the technology to build, then of course the next step is to build up. The city, a tower, its head in the he top in the heavens. I'm not going to do it today because it's not a subject, but I would urge you to consider a parallel between this tower at, and with its head in the heavens and Jacob's ladder, which was in the heavens, or its top was in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. Lest we disperse over the earth. God came down to see the tower and the city that the people had built. Behold, they are one people in one language, and this is what they have begun to do. Therefore, God says, I will prevent this from taking place. We will mix up their languages so they will not understand each other. God disperses them. They stop building the city. And of course, our king Kreshma, Bavel, hence the name Bavel, because Bavel says the Torah comes from the word Balal, Balal Hashem, Sfat Kol Aretz. God mixed up all the languages and scattered them. And then the rest of it is the continuing the descendants of Shem through Abraham and Terach. We'll talk about that at the end of the year today. That's the story. So some basic obvious questions. First of all, what's so terrible about unity? Right? We all clamor, for, we dream about a unified people in a unified uh, society. So that's, that's just a basic question. But what is this? Safahat, this single language, when they were already identified by nations and geography and language. And what is this tower and how does stopping this tower address their, their issue? What is the sin? What was so terrible about building this tower in the first place? Rashi insists that uh, dealing with God intervening against uh, the building of this tower, there must be something theologically problematic like idolatry here. And so Rashi says, uh, right, Famously, Rashi's comment that we'll go up to the heavens and we will conquer the skies. And where does Rashi get this from? That the tower intent of the builders of the tower wanted to run into the heavens and throw God out. There's no reference to that in the story. Well, it says we'll build a tower, pen the foots, lest we scatter over the earth, we'll make for ourselves a name by building a tower. We live in a world where towers and skyscrapers are the best way to make yourself uh, famous. That's exactly what they wanted to do. So where does Rashi get the idea from that building this tower was a way of going up to the heavens and throwing God out? Well, the answer is I already gave it. I gave you the answer already. Where did, where did Rashi see this idea that the arrogance of the king of Bavel 
was in the effort to go into the heavens and remove God and sit on God's throne. That's precisely what Yeshayahu ascribes to Nebuchadnezzar, right? That's exactly the, the proclamation. I will go up into the heavens and sit above the clouds and I will be the one on high instead of God. So Rashi links the story of Nebuchadnezzar to the story of, ne of the Tower of Babel and attributes to them the same chet. Whether that's true in the pshat of it or not, but that's clearly where Rashi is drawing that idea from. Rashi is bothered by the fact that there's no reference to the idea theology of throwing God out of the heavens and building of the tower. So the Rishbam offers a somewhat different interpretation. He says God had commanded humanity to pop populate, to fill the world, and they chose instead to gather in one place, not to spread out over the world. That was against God's design of creation. But again, for that it sounds Rashi's description of the chait of the door of the generation of the tower sounds much more plausible, much more intense. In fact, there's a lengthy Gemara in uh, Sanhedrin that offers various opinions as to what was going on. I'll just take a brief look at it. Dora Palaga en lem Mishnah says that the people who built this tower kind of lost their chelok, their share in the world to come. What did they do wrong? So Gemara offers several answers. First answer, the Bay of Shiloh. They wanted to build, says the Gemara, a tower that would go up into the heavens so that they can take their axes into the heavens and strike God down and see God bleed. That was the first answer. The Gemara has a very kind of uh, satirical response. They, they laughed at this explanation in Israel, in the West, because they said, if they wanted to go up to the heavens and throw God out or to stab God with a spear, then they shouldn't have gone into the valley to build the tower. They should have started with a head start. They should have started by building the tower at the top of a mountain. I'm not sure that that's really an answer. But Yermiel ben Elazar says, with different people there having different intentions. Some said that we'll go up to the heavens and we, there we will live. Others suggest we'll go up into the heavens and, and we will worship idolatry or we will worship other gods. We'll bring our gods with us, so to speak. And one suggested that they will go up into the heavens and 11 will make war with God. To which the Gemara's conclusion is that there, all of these answers really stem from a perversion of the concept of deity or God, kulam l'shem avodah zara nit kavnu. But I come back to the question, what was the intention? What was the pshat of the story? The story is so central. The story of the tower of the, of the flood, we can work through the science of it, but the story of the flood we understand, it's relatively straightforward. The story of the tower is very short, it's very concise, its impact is far-reaching, and yet there's so much mystery around it. We don't even know what the chait was. And yet God directly intervenes. In, this, in the generation of the flood, the Torah tells us exactly what the chait was. People were killing each other. So God intervened. The tower, what was the, what was the issue? So I want to share with you what happened to this floor now. I don't know how that got out of order. I apologize for that. I want to share with you the inside of the floor now. And I think this floor now is very important because really amongst all of the commentaries that I have seen, I think this floor now understood the, geopol the geopolitical message, context of all of the pieces of the puzzle. Meaning, we're talking about an, a land of Shin'ar. If we're talking about a land of Shin'ar, we're talking about right, the, the, the tower is placed in Eret Shin'ar. Eret Shin'ar is exactly the region of who? Who is king of Shin'ar? We'll go back to the Psukim in uh, Migdal Bavel. 
Um, Nimrod. Nimrod. Right? That's exactly. They start. Eretz Shinar. Eretz Shinar is the land of Nimrod. Right? So suddenly, within the same context, I have Nimrod, Gibor, warrior, Gibor Tzayid, and I have in Eretz Shinar, and I have a tower in Eretz Shinar that begins with the description of a people, Safachatudvarimachadim, building this great tower. Comes along this far now, and I apologize for the um, jumping around, uh, you know, maybe we'll do it here. Be a little less jumping around. Let's see if this forno is here. Not here. I will have to go back. I apologize for that. Um, Okay, we'll do it on the source. I apologize. Says Nimrod. Says this is for now. How many blenonu ear? What is this tower, the city? Zot haita atzat sarei hador. What do they intend to do? Lahamlich et Nimrod al hamin al kol hamin haenoshi. Intention was not just to build a city but to build a kingdom. What the Svoino recognized is that a city with a tower, ir u migdal, a migdal is a fortress. And a city with a fortress is essentially a kingdom or a place of a mela. And who is going to stand at the top of that tower? Who is going to stand at the top of that tower and look out at the city that they had built with their hands. Migdal v'doshav v'shamayim v'nesel anushem. What does it mean, nasa shem? He says, havadah zarash shatiyeh b'migdal will put some sort of idol at the top of this tower. V'yetze b'chol amin enoshi shem, enoshi shem gova mekoma, the godel ira, the name of this Great, the reputation of this great tower, of this great city, of this great Migdal will go over all, will be recognized by all of humanity. Everybody will see this deity as towering over everybody else, part of the pun. Says this one. Nimloch al kol amin enoshi biyot sham duishat kulam. Whoever reigns over this city and this tower reigns over all of humanity. Now, what the Sforno is suggesting, I believe, in this story, which I think is the core of the message, is that what they wanted to do is not. Let's go back to the text for a second. They're all of one language. Why do they have one language and one speech? Not because they all come from one cultural and identity, one region, one nation, and therefore speak one language. But I can bring together all kinds of different peoples of different languages and different tongues and give them all one language, one tongue, one speech, and one identity very easily. It's called You, in, in the language of Tanakh, it's usually called conquest. It's usually called an empire. In other words, the, if we're talking about Eretz Shinar, and we're talking about the land of Nimrod, and Nimrod is Gibor Tzayed Lifnei Hashem, as a warrior, and suddenly I go from all kinds of different nations and different regions, speaking different tongues, and Mishpuchotahem, and Goyahem, and nationalities, and suddenly they're all one region, one nation, one tongue, that's not a 
natural development. That's an artificial development. That's a tower and a building that was created to tower over them and to bring them together by force of conquest into being one nation, one peoples, one Safa, one Dvarim. And now you build a tower that literally towers over them, says the Sforno. Who's going to stand at the top of that tower? Who's going to look out and say, this is my kingdom? I am the king over all of these nations and all of these regions, and you will all pay homage and bow to me. Answer. Who's the king of Shina? Nimrod. That's precisely the story of this tower. It wasn't about theology. It was about politics. It was about placing one king as a king of an empire over the entire world. That is a very dangerous precedent in the language of Tanakh. In the language of Tanakh, there is only one king over the universe, over all of humanity, and that's God. To place a human being as king over all of the other kings and as, an, as a global hegemony, global empire, is a theme that Tanakh fights against from the Tower of Babel to Nebuchadnezzar. And every attempt at creating a global hegemony in that context has failed in Tanakh because God intervenes to prevent it from happening. Because if you place all of humanity under one banner, that banner is benevolent, great. And if that banner is Nazism, we're all in trouble. One all-powerful leader has never been an answer that the Torah or that Tanakh has embraced because it's fraught with danger. The only, uh, here's another example. Daniel, Parag Dalad, we're going to get to this next uh, in our next unit. Chapter four, same Nebuchadnezzar. The context of here is not our, our issue. It's another moment of Nebuchadnezzar's arrogance. After 12 months, he comes up to the top of his, of his palace. He was walking on the top of his tower, on the top of his kingdom, and he looks out and he says the following, and think for a moment what he's saying and whether these words would fit. First of all, the, the description Yeshayahu describes of Nebuchadnezzar's arrogance with the description of Bavel, Tower, and Nimrod as the Sforna describes it. What did Nebuchadnezzar say? Rabta. This is the great Bavel. The Ana Benate I built Levet Malchu with my vast power, Bitkaf Chisni, Likar Hadari, and with the glory of my majesty as a royal residence, Levet Malchu. This is the Bava. This is my kingdom that I built with my power and the glory of my majesty. Well, in chapter four, it doesn't take more than 10 seconds for the words to come out of his mouth before God transforms Nebuchadnezzar into a beast of the field for seven years to teach him a little humility. That story we'll get to. Can you imagine the statement, the arrogance I could just see just see Nebuchadnezzar, uh, um, Nimrod standing at the tower of the top of this tower, looking out of his great kingdom, says the Swarno, and saying, This is the great Bavel, or this is the great tower, the Migdal of Shinar, that I built with my power and my strength and my majesty for all of humanity to come and be united under my banner. And God says, not today, not on my watch. And so he enters into history to put a stop to, to Nimrod's great tower. That, says Sforno, is essentially the story. It's about the politics. And the other Mephoshim will make the same claim. I think Chazal essentially said this, but they do so with other nuances. For example, Nebuchadnezzar put this great statue of gold, 60 amot high, which is a symbol of Nebuchadnezzar's arrogance. Where did he put it? In the valley of Dura, Bibikat Dura. We don't know where Bibikat Dura is. It's not told to us in the story. But look what the Malbim says. 
להעמיד אותו בבקעת דורה, ולדברי חז"ל, היא עצמה הבקעה שנתקבצו בו דור הפלגה לבנות המגדל. חז"ל say that this valley where Nebuchadnezzar put his statue is the same valley in which the tower of Bava was built. Now, Chazal didn't say that arbitrarily. They said that because they saw in the statue the exact same arrogance that they saw in the story of the, of the tower. The tower was also intended to build a kind of eternal, all-encompassing power and malchus. And to right, to fight against the heavens. They were the same purpose. The Tower of Bavel and the Statue of Nebuchadnezzar served exactly the same purpose. To reflect the power of the king and his eternity, and ultimately his fact that he was king not only over his kingdom, but over all the kingdoms. And hence the description in the case of Migdal Bavel of Kol because Nimrod had, because Nebuchadnezzar no, no, in this case, Nimrod, sorry. <laughs> Nimrod had in fact conquered them and brought them together artificially as one nation. Not that they were, in, in, that this was kind of indigenous to a population that spoke one language. But on the contrary, from the separate languages you describe in chapter 10, suddenly they're all speaking one language because they're all speaking Nimrod's language. That, says the Sforno, is what the tower represented, Nimrod's power and his might, and ultimately what God, a, a power that got too strong and too arrogant, and God had to intervene. And in that intervention, and in God's providential intervention in the tower, the message goes out that ultimately there's only one king of king of kings. I, I shared with you once before the notion that Nebuchadnezzar describes himself as king of kings. So we describe God as king of king of kings, because there's only one global power in the world, and that's a Kodesh Baruch. The notion of a human king is literally establishing global conquest is an anathema to the theme of Tanakh. And that starts in Migdal Babel. And from Migdal Babel to Nebuchadnezzar, that theme is consistent literally divide and conquer. Divide the nations, the world into nations. Divide the world into nations. Why? Because divided, we can all recognize that there's one power above us all. But unite humanity into one earthly power, that's very dangerous. That's the geopolitical message of Tanakh. And it starts with Migdal Bavel and it ends with Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, so from just to put things in context where we are right now, we've explained the tower and the arrogance of Nimrod and the tower or the statue and the arrogance of the Nebuchadnezzar, the intervention of God in the case of the tower and the intervention of God in the context of the um, of Nebuchadnezzar's statue. And as if to reflect a similar message that ultimately both of these challenge godliness in the world, and therefore God had no choice but to intervene. I want to take us back into a very interesting uh, phenomenon here. Because what I haven't done is one more piece of the puzzle I haven't linked. Because Chazal get to all of this, how? By connecting Hanani Mishael of Azaria, so the fiery furnace, to Abraham and his furnace. Where is Abraham in the story? Where is Abraham in the story? So there are two points of departure to connect back to Abraham. One is midrashic, and the other is textual. So actually, I'm going to start from the midrashic context. There's a pasuk in chapter 10. Remember, the tower is in chapter, the beginning of chapter 11. Beginning of chapter 11. It's a pasuk in chapter 10 that describes a kind of a genealogical 
generations from Noach to the tower, or essentially, or to Avraham. And there we have a reference to Ever. Famous Shem and Ever, Ever grandson of Shem, has two sons. One is named Peleg, Kibiyamav Niflagaharetz. In his day was the story of the tower of the dispersion of humanity. And his younger brother, Yoktan, both mentioned in chapter 10. From this verse, the Medrash Seder Olam Rabbah builds the entire chronology of the generations from the flood to the tower, because it attempts to pinpoint exactly when the tower event took place by suggesting it took place at the end of the life of Peleg. Now, we could argue it took place at the beginning of his life. That's why he's named after the tower. Because I'll actually say it can't be because Yuktan, who's his younger brother, is mentioned in the previous chapter. So for that reason, because I'll say it's not at the beginning of Peleg's life, but in fact, the end of Peleg's life, you know, the, the Medrash and Seder Olam, um, Medrash says, Amr of Yossi, Navi Gadolaya Ever, Shekarab no Peleg. Ever was a great prophet because he named his son Peleg. Ruach HaKodesh, as it says, Biyamav Niflagaaretz, Rashi quotes us on the Pasuk as well, that uh, Yoktan is younger and is mentioned in the previous chapters, so clearly it doesn't mean the end of his life, can't mean some vague moment in the middle of his life, so it must mean that his death coincided with the Tower of Bavel, and he's called Peleg, whether he was called Peleg Ruach HaKodesh, or he's called Peleg at his death, so to speak, because that was coincided with the Tower itself. Be that as it may, based on that, the Medrash then pulls together all of the lineage of the generations. Rather than doing it in the text, I'm simply going to show you the chart. And the chart, literally, this is based simply on the psukim I've given you, the sources, and the psukim in chapter 10. From Noah, who's 600 years at the time of the flood, let's assume for the moment the flood is year zero, for all intents and purposes. Apachshad is born two years after the flood, then Shelach when Apachshad is 35, Eva when Apachshad is 30. This is all in chapter 10 and 11. You can just read the text and you can see the ages. Uh, Ru'u is 30, Epelag is 30 when he has Ru'u, Ru'u is 32 when he has Srug, Srug is 30 when he has Nachor, Nachor is 29 when he has Terach, Terach is 70 when he has Abraham. Peleg lives for 239 years, which means drum roll, and if I work through the numbers, the exact year of the dispersion of the tower is 340 years after the flood. And according to the chronology, it means that Abraham is 48 years old at the time of the tower above. Process that for a second. Bereshit Rabbah, how old was Abraham when he recognized God? Now, we all know the story. I want to stop sharing for a second because I want us to hear this. We all know the story. If I take any child from the day school and I said to them at the age of uh, as a first grader, and I said, how old was Abraham when he first discovered God? They would tell me? 75. Three. They would tell me he was three, right? They all know the story. He's three years old. He asks us. Who, who who made the stars, who made the moon, who made the bill, right? Who made Abraham's theological journey searching at the age of three. Comes along the Medrash and says, wait a second, that might be, it's based on a Pasuk, but I have a much better answer for you. said, ben Abaim hikir Abraham et bo'o. Abraham was 48 years old when he recognized God. Rishlaki says he was three. I'm less bothered by Rishlaki's opinion. It's more philosophical than anything else. I, it doesn't have any textual ref references. But 48 is a number that pulls, that sounds like you pulled a number out of a hat. Why is Abraham 48 when he recognized God? Well, now we have the answer. What major event, upheaval in society and global geopolitics? that has transformed society to the point of recognizing that he was all of humanity united under one banner. There was no greater power on the planet than Nimrod. 
and yet Nimrod's efforts failed because somebody or something intervened above Nimrod, above the king of kings, more powerful than the king of kings. Who could be more powerful than the king of kings? Says Abraham at the age of 48, who's a bystander watching this tower crumble and watching the global effort to unite humanity under one warrior banner fail and comes along and says, God, is, there's a God who is controlling this history. It's not a philosophical journey, it's a historical journey. He sees that intervention and he feels that effort. Now, where did Chazal get this from? It's very simple. Here's the story in Migdabavo. Here's Parakid Aleph. Here's the tower. After the story of the tower in Parakid Aleph, we have the following account. All that chronology that I just shared with you is all in this parak. The same parak, just after the flood, tells us the whole story of the generations, Peleg, Aver, who gets Peleg, and he, and he names him after this after the dispersion, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, until the birth of Abraham. And Terach is 70 years old when he has Abraham. Abraham Nachor and Haran. Ayla told the Terach, Terach will lead Abraham, Haran, etc. Haran dies. That's the verse upon which the Medrash in Bereshit Rabbah tells us the whole story of the fiery furnace, Nimrod. God, Abraham comes before Nimrod because he, had, because he serves God and Nimrod wants to throw him into the fiery furnace. Says the Medrash, that's the story of the Kivshanesh, that's the story of Nebuchadnezzar. That's Abraham against Nimrod is exactly Hanani bin Shalva Zarya against Nebuchadnezzar. Here is the Jew who says there's a God that's more powerful than Nimrod who stands up and defends God and who believes and who discovers God. And the story of Abraham and the family's migration to Canaan starts here. And they begin to the journey to the land of Canaan. Lech Lucha only starts in the next parasha. And all the Mephoshim ask the question, why does God suddenly appear to Abraham? When suddenly out of nowhere he comes to Abraham and he says, I choose you? But the optical illusion is we start the story of Abraham from Pasha Lech Lucha. The story of Abraham doesn't start in Pasha Lech Lucha. It starts in Pasha Noach. It starts in the aftermath of the tower. Abraham emerges from the ashes of the tower. That's the story of Abraham. And that's what Chazal wanted us to see in linking Nechanan Yomishel of Azariah and their stance against the arrogance, the theological arrogance of Nebuchadnezzar. It tells me, go back to the story of Nebuchadnezzar's predecessor and the context of the arrogance of Bavel, the empire of Bavel begins in the tower and suddenly you recognize and you see the milieu from which Abraham emerges. That's the context of that message. So I often, when I shared this whole story, I often get asked the question, so was Abraham thrown into the furnace or wasn't he? I don't know. Probably not. You'll forgive me. But it doesn't matter. Because Chazal weren't trying to tell me that he was thrown into the furnace. Chazal were trying to tell me that Chanani Mishal of Azariah's experience by Nimrod essentially teaches me where Abraham's story begins and where Abraham comes from. He comes from, I'm sorry, Chanani Mishal of Azariah's experience of Nebuchadnezzar teaches me what Abraham's experience in the Bavel experience of the tower and the world in which he emerges. That's the context of that medrash and how it links to Hanani Mishal of Azariah. We're going to stop here. I thank you for the extra two minutes. Where we're going to go next, which is in two weeks' time, because there's no class next week, is the one piece of the story we have yet to uh, come back to. So we kind of went into a diversion, or digression, I should say, from uh, the world of Abraham. But um, where we're going to uh, now, we need to come back to the question of what is the statue of Nebuchadnezzar, and why Hanani Meshav Azariah didn't bow down to it, and whether they were right, or maybe they were wrong. Were they right to to 
allow themselves to their lives to be threatened by uh, not bowing down to this uh, statue. What was the statue? So all of those pieces we will explore Beshav Hashem next week. The, this background to understand the tower will help us understand the statue, what it represented, what it was physically, what it looked like even possibly, and thereby enable us to understand Hanani Mishal Azariah's uh, experience much better. So that's the background. I thank you for listening to me for uh, close to an hour. Uh, I will be happy to stay on for a few more minutes and answer some of the questions in the chat. But we've officially uh, ended the class, so I uh, will um, thank you for uh, for sharing and for coming and for joining us. Thank you. Rabbi, thank you very Rabbi, much. Rabbi. Excellent, excellent class. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Just back. Back to you all. Such a masterful teacher you are. My God. Thank you, you thank inspire you. us all. I wrote it in the chat, but I'll just say, you know, your passion for it is infectious. You just make it absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can, can I ask a communal question? Mm -hmm. Another member sure. asked it as well. The difference uh, between the two words for language. Um, between Safa and Lashon. Yeah, I, I if the Mal, if I was the Malbim, yeah. I would probably delve into a whole analysis of the difference and nuance between the between them. I, I I tend not to get overly really excited about that. I'm not convinced no. that they do mean anything significantly okay. different. <laughs> okay. um, yeah. I think they are synonymous. Yeah. Um, yeah. In the yeah. same way that in Megillat yeah. Esther, you have Ktav and Lashon. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I, I think they're somewhat synonymous with each other. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I just, I just told you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. I um, let me just see if there's anything in the chat. Um, it's about to okay. So at five, I started having meetings. Oh, so the question of, of um, somebody asked the question of the chronology by Abraham. That's an interesting question altogether. Um, Abraham's journey, okay. if it starts at the age of 48, uh, until you get to a Navua, according to some suggestions of the earliest Navua he has is the Brit Ben at the age of 70, but uh, it, it that's going to take time to develop that relationship. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, so, all right, we could go into his whole second sh hour shear on the connection to Hanukkah, but I'll leave that for your imagination to go from uh, Nebuchadnezzar to so Nimrod to Nebuchadnezzar to Antiochus Epiphanes. Not a big jump, very easy to kind of make that connection and uh, and and see the story of Hanukkah in there. So that's your Hanukkah connection, and I'm going to say at least a Hanukkah reference on uh, shear that takes place on Hanukkah. Have a wonderful evening or a wonderful afternoon or a wonderful morning. Enjoy all over the world. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thanks, Amaya. Thanks, Amaya.